1936, U.S. radio engineer Alfred Norton Goldsmith wrote a short article assessing the role of television among the visual arts. In contrast to the sober implications of the article, the viewpoint presented here was not that of a conventional consulting engineer. Goldsmith, who you see here demonstrating a wire photography system, was a key figure in the interwar history of television in the US, who served as vice president and general manager of the Radio Corporation of America in the early 1930s. In 1936, Goldsmith was optimistic about the future of television, quote, a major visual art with a technique of its own, and with broad application of great public interest and commercial significance, end quote. Throughout the text, a certain ambiguity lingers regarding what is actually meant by quote-unquote visual art. For Goldsmith, the expression carried a dual meaning. It was synonymous with fine art, but it also encompassed the definition found in technological and patent uh, text, essentially signifying the activities made possible by an invention or the invention itself. As such, Goldsmith was repeating RCA President David Sarnoff's 1930s rhetoric on the new democratic and Middlebrough culture that would emerge with the widespread adoption of TV sets. As I will show today, his, his perspective, however, was just one facet of Goldsmith's discourse. In his article, he also elaborated on the role of TV as fine art, echoing numerous debates discussing the specificity of television as a medium. In the context of this debate, Goldsmith's view over the possibility of an art of television had been discussed several times as example of a somewhat shallow and exclusively technologically, technological exploration of the medium. In a 1938 op-ed film, uh, op sorry, film critic Terry Ramsey wrote, for example, that the savvy Dr. Goldsmith with his many inventions promoted an understanding of, quote, television as a miracle of how and an itching void of what, end quote. Ramsey's critique was somewhat unfair. The problem of the essence of television was also for Goldsmith a pressing issue, one revolving around questions of remediation or how much of the existing media television was supposed to incorporate. Goldsmith discussed in his essay the relation of film to television, but he also explored the role of more traditional media on this topic, uh, what he suggested repeated a common conception of the 1940s and 50s. The idea suggested, um, uh, briefly summarized in 1946 by trade writer Hoyland Bettinger, that television techniques are, quote, as old as the arts from which they are derived, end quote. Following this logic, television was also engaging in the remediation of paint painting principles and rules. Thus, century-old theories on the psychological effect of such coordinates as lines, mass, and form were essential in crafting a compelling television image, as these diagrams published in Bettinger books uh, illustrate. As Bettinger himself acknowledged, such a structural and pictorial approach amounted to, quote, thinking of the televisual image in its abstract form. In the 1940s, and to a greater extent in the 1930s, the term abstraction used in a television context can be understood along somewhat different lines. This alternative interpretation will be the guiding principle of my discussion today, and I'm referring to uh, Raymond Williams's description of early image transmissions essay as abstract processes that were preceding the arrival of televisual contents. In the experimental era, that's the idea, uh, or in other words, in the interwar period, I will be discussing the low definition of images amounted to an abstraction used to test the potentialities of new technologies. I owe this particular um, idea to um, art historian Christian Mehring, who has published in 2008 a prehistory of television or video art, primarily focusing on the German context and on Naim June Pike's entourage. 
expanding the understanding of what Mehring has called television's abstract start well before 1944, I will trace today a media archaeology of TV experiments in the interwar focusing on intersection between North American telecommunication laboratories and a vast network of artists and engineers who revolved around Alfred Goldsmith. I will show that as early as the first half of the 1930s, if not earlier, the United States served as the backdrop for a lively debate addressing the artistic potential of television and its impact over society, um, a debate that anticipates some of, theme, of the themes later developed in television, video art, but also cybernetic art. Um, and uh, just a quick word, my approach will be informed by, of course, Valérie's text, which has been uh, already discussed. Uh, but also by recent uh, account of, of television, and uh, I'm here thinking of uh, Doron Galedi work and Anne-Catherine Weber, who have discussed the intermediate nature of the medium, and I'm forgetting André Lange also, who has underlined this point well before. Um, despite, or perhaps because of Goldsmith's vast technical knowledge, his understanding of television art was unquestionably intermediate. His first involvement in the field of visual art after resigning from, from his office at RCA in the mid-30s attests to such conception. Throughout the decade, Goldsmith was collaborating with the early US media artist Thomas Wolfred, the inventor in 1922 of a device called the Clavilux, a visual organ projecting silent abstract color sequences in pure light using optical and electrical systems, so a form of... Um, um, uh, vernacular uh, American moral lineage, one could say. Um, Goldsmith's collaboration with Wilfred primarily revolved around seeking a manufacturing firm to produce smaller versions of the Clavilux. This ambitious but unrealized project aimed to fulfill Wilfred's long-standing dream dating back to the 1920s, that of making Clavilux devices available in every household. Initially, Wilfred's efforts involved creating the small machine that would project light spectacles onto the ceilings, onto ceilings, and it is likely that Goldsmith's inputs influenced the marketing strategy for this device, which incorporated the commercial rhetoric often associated with electricity supply at the time, a technology that Paul Valéry described as a model for the ubiquitous transformation of the art to come. Um, Goldsmith's correspondence from the early 1930s provide evidence that he considered Wilfred's art as part of the broad spectrum of experiments he perceived as television. However, this acknowledgement wasn't merely rooted in a metaphorical interpretation of electric vision or on the notable resemblance between television sets and the cabinets housing Wilfred's mechanism. In his letters to Goldsmith, Wilfred also shared his project to broadcast his color light projection, an idea that would have consisted in plugging onto a radio his Clavilux Junior, a scheme patented by various inventors throughout the 1920s, uh, which marked the first appearance of what uh, became later known in electrical engineering as a, a color organ. From a technical standpoint, it is important to note that this method did not involve the direct broadcasting of visual content. Instead, it operated by translating a radio signal into a colorful spectacle using projective techniques patented by Wilfred. However, and given that the signal originated from a remote resource, that of radio, it was interpreted as a mean of receiving visual color messages. This interpretation explains why the device inspired by Wolford's idea and developed by RCA during Goldsmith's tenure was later referred to in the trade press as the telecolor, and these articles all uh, portray this, de describe this machine as an experimental precursor to television, color television in particular. The culmination of Wilfred's art and Goldsmith's artistic exploration of television occurred in late September 1938, when light reflections of a smaller version of Wilfred's Clavilux were captured at the RCA NBC studios in New York and broadcast on one of the first channels in the history of cathode ray television, which had been operated since August of the same year. 
This experiment seemed uh, to have arisen out of the necessity to transmit abstract patterns specially designed for television broadcasting that were not using film. And maybe here we're seeing the, the first signs of the demarcation between film and television that Doran was discussing earlier. Um, the underlying rationale here was grounded on a rhetoric of medium specificity which was closely tied to the um, technical constraints of early cathode ray tubes. Wilfred Sclavilux was indeed projecting the great amount of illumination needed in early electronic television. A similar logic guided contemporaneous endeavors, uh, which also aim at crafting a distinct televisual abstract imagery, such as the case with uh, Williams Eddy video kaleidoscope, a classic kaleidoscope apparatus that was designed to provide a very bright televisual image that did not have any of the recurring strains and default that frequently appeared on the outer edges of early cathode ray screens. If the experimental broadcasting of Wilfrid's or Eddie's imagery were probably realized in view of future use in advertising, Goldsmith did not merely envision television art as a matter of decoration. In March of 1931, he articulated uh, the role of Wilfred's device within the broader context of what he envisioned as, quote-unquote, electric entertainment. This vision entailed equipping every American household with a radio-television system combined with a Wilfred-style apparatus. Goldsmith underscored the profound advantages of Wilfred's machine over existing broadcasting devices, particularly its interactive nature, which enable precise control over the flow of images through knobs and rheostats. As Goldsmith explained, the great uh, disadvantage of broadcasting technologies was their one-way communicative pattern that rendered the individual passive and created a distance between humans and art contents. The solution was what the engineer called self-programming, a means to provide users the ability to quote, portray their own imagination and ultimately to blur, I'm quoting here, blur the lines between reality and imagination, um, a sentence strangely anticipating yet countering Lacanian Kitlerian categories. Through this logic, the commercial agendas of American electrical, uh, electrical companies somehow meets the critical theories of the refunctionalization of radio as proposed at the same time by Bertolt Brecht or Walter Benjamin. But Goldsmith's approach of television and art was also uh, highly conceptual, accompanied by the idea that transmission, and there's um, a different way of thinking of dematerialization here, that transmission technology brought about a transformation in the materiality of visual art. This notion was shared by many artists and resonated with the reception of Wilfred's work um, and also that of Theremin that we have already mentioned uh, several times and uh, um, Golds uh, Goldsmith was responsible for the mass uh, producing of the uh, Theremin at RCA in the early 30s. So there's a connection here uh, talking about ether and, um, and, and, and devices and television. This places Goldsmith's concept of television within what art historians have described as vibratory modernism, a modern cosmology of waves and frequency which, among many creation, informed the turn towards abstraction through the idea of rendering the unseen visible, a theme explored in the US by uh, painter Arthur Dove, who here depicts sound being transmitted over the telephone. In the sound-oriented archaeology of television I'm tracing today, this also corresponds to what uh, media archaeologist Wolfgang Ernst has called sonicity, a concept designating an episteme of frequency heralded by the medium of radio, uh, but a theory that is also uh, applicable to television. Mary Hallock Greenwald, Thomas Wolfrid's most ferocious compositor in the field of early media art and inventor of various dispositive, uh, various projective device of the kind of the, of the clavilux, furnished the best example of such creative exploration of sonicity. In articles and interviews published in the early 1920s, Greenwald discussed the possibility of broadcasting color symphony. Since radio waves and light propagate through the same medium, she explained, the wireless transmission of light and color composition was not a fanciful dream, but a concrete possibility offered by new technology. 
as Greenwald further explained, this involved, quote, increasing the vibration of the radio wave by about a, million, a billion times so it would be fast enough to record as color, end quote. The possibility of broadcasting colored messages revives the modernist project of creating a color language, a lexicon structured according to the emotional value of color use. So th the difference here with Moholinage would be that this is more focused on color than on light per se. The concept uh, of um, uh, color language had been widely discussed at the turn of the century by abstract art pioneers, and in the 1920s, uh, Greenwald described uh, in several interviews and unpublished writing the universal emotional appeal of such a language that could potentially replace the newly created languages uh, of, such as Esperanto. She remarked, quote, perhaps color will eventually become the universal language nosing out all other contenders before they more than left the starting point. Anyway, experimenters say it is not too much to believe that in time color communication will be added to wireless telegraphy, wireless telephony, telepathy, and the other systems now in force. In the 1920s, Greenwald speculation were also shared by Goldsmith himself and seemed as part of the vast spectrum of ideas surrounding early television in the US. Faced with the linguistic challenge that emerged as international communication expanded in the first decade of the 20th century, Goldsmith, like many of his peers, considered uh, in time the adoption of a neutral universal language such as Esperanto. This, as Caroline Marvin has suggested, was considered a tool to implement a world society that would result from the removal of tele telecommunication barrier an utopia widespread among uh, early telecommunication engineers who seem to have been anticipating on that matter uh, such notion as the global village. What I have described so far suggests many commonalities between Goldsmith and the artist uh, on the future of television. As I've suggested in my introduction, this subject was, however, the topic of a heated debate and the model I've just described was uh, only one of the models uh, discussed. An alternative theory of media art in the face preceding the actual emergence of television existed in the US, and it was, by all accounts, well known to Goldsmith. This alternative theory was formulated by the Russian composer Josef Schillinger, seen here uh, with one of Lev Theremin synthesizers. Essentially known today in the field of musical theory for its mathematical compositional system, Schillinger had in fact developed a very ambitious computational art method that could be used in graphics, art, film, and photography. According to Schillinger's approach, which he presented as an alternative to, existing, to all existing media ex experiments at the time, including Wilfred, um, every form of art should be, uh, are subjected to the same quote-unquote, artistic differential rule. This rule revolved around the idea that from a mathematical perspective, beauty could be expressed as a derivation from a, quote, homogeneous harmonic series, end quote. The evaluation of the aesthetic quality of art production um, in Schillinger's method wasn't simply a repetition of the many theories involving harmonious proportion or golden rules that have emerged throughout the history of modern art. For Schillinger, his method represented the outcome of an interplay between, quote, technology and artistic mechanism on the one hand, and psychophysiological reactions on the other, end quote. In a diagram illustrating the artistic development toward a complex perception resulting from the application of his method, Schillinger depicted the transformation of an artistic impulse into a signal which was then recorded by a media storage medium and eventually broadcast via radio for consumption at home on uh, televisual devices, uh, he referred to in other unpublished writing as artomaton. Schillinger's computational method played an important role in a broader project that consisted in reshaping creative processes in light of the ability to transmit optical media. By replacing the meaningful content of art with a system of schematic coordinates and transmission, Schillinger's method foreshadowed aspects of the information theory, uh, which Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver would formalize uh, later in the 1940s. Specifically, 
Both information theory and the Schillinger method shared the goal of eliminating meaningful content in the process of communication. As Shannon, as Shannon famously noted in 1948, information should not be confused with meaning or, in, in other words, with the content of uh, the message. This last element suggests a different archaeology of television that blurs the distinction between televisual and computational media. To a certain extent, Schillinger was right when describing the future of transmitted images as the products of mathematics. The attempt to create an abstract televisual imagery through light projection and kaleidoscopes were soon replaced by the direct tracing of light within the cathode ray tube, made possible with a precise calculus of current intensity. This was suggested as early as 1937, um, here on the left, by RCA engineer C.A. Burnett, who developed a testing method for CRT that consisted in painting checkerboard patterns onto the phosphorescent layers of the tube, a method that later informed 1950s experiment with the oscilloscope. Um, here, Ben Lapowski on the right. In conclusion, uh, there is indeed a pre-war history of artistic experiment with television in North America, and this despite the competitive and corporate context from which the medium emerged in the interwar US. This history can only be traced through media archaeology that appears to reveal stark contrast between the rigor of the Schillinger method and the poetics inclination of some of the artists connected to Goldsmiths. This division suggests a significant rift within the uh, early realm of US television. One, on the one side, a tradition primarily concerned with the essence, quality, and phenomenology of the transmitted images took form around Goldsmith and Wilfred. And on the other lies Schillinger's functionalist perspective that considers transmission as imposing a computational revolution of the arts. If one conception may suggest an archaeology of video art and the other an archaeology of television art, such an easy categorization would obscure the common themes of distance and ubiquity that artists explored within both traditions. Despite the differences I've highlighted, early US discussion and experiments in television art all anticipated a revolution caused by the arrival of new telecommunication technologies long before clear boundaries between video and television were established by post-war artists, a frontier that media archaeology advised to reconsider, the experiments I have discussed today all align with Valérie's overarching concept of a conquest of ubiquity. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>